So I think, so we do have a quorum. We're missing uh, Marissa and Rich. They're not going to join us today, um, but I think we should go ahead and start. And um, so this is, so welcome. This is the May 9th meeting of the Northampton Energy and Sustainability Committee. We are recording this. The recording will be posted on Northampton Open Media um, at some point in the near future. Um, and we, I think, should um, can go ahead and start with um, the first item on the agenda. Um, sorry, had this up. Um, which is public comment. So um, if anybody would like to make a public comment that's not otherwise on the agenda, um, if you could raise your hand um, and um, we can go from there. And I see Adele Franks, your hand is raised. So do you want to go ahead? I think she needs to be unmuted. I thought she was. Um, let me just double check here. Yeah, she's I'm unmuted. Now I'm unmuted. Sorry about yeah. that. I'm, I'm speaking on behalf of Eric Broadbent, who was unable to attend today. And um, he really wanted uh, to initiate a conversation about energy coach programs um, because he, in a previous place that he lived in Massachusetts, um, he was an energy coach and he has now agreed to become, to um, embark upon the uh, free um, energy coach um, uh, I'm sorry, I'm forgetting the name of it, the, the um, uh, alliance that, uh, that provides um, free uh, energy coach training, and he is being trained as an energy coach, and therefore, he is listed um, now when somebody calls them and they say, um, gee, I, I really need help about my building and what should I do? And they happen to be from Northampton. They give him Eric's name. And so um, Eric is getting a whole lot of calls uh, from people in Northampton who want help figuring out what to do with their buildings. And, um, and I'm getting emails, um, wow. which is even funnier because um, I'm certainly not a, a, an engineer or a building science person. And, um, uh, but there are so many people in our community who are looking for help, trying to figure out what is the right thing to do, what is the order they should do it in, et cetera. And so he really wanted to bring up the, I, the concept to you all um, about creating an energy coach program for Northampton um, and perhaps for surrounding communities and, um, and to gauge your interest in, in moving forward on that. So that's, that's uh, my piece. And um, we know that um, the, the, uh, the Alliance is one group that provides free uh, coaching because they are they train coaches um, because they are an all volunteer organization. Um, but then there's also Abode Energy, which is a for profit company that um, that also provides energy coach training and has a whole program to work with municipalities. Um, the, but they charge for that. So, uh, so those are the two things that we know about so far. And uh, I will stop talking now. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, any other public comment? Greece has got her hand up. Okay. Hi, this is Therese Hammerly, um, Northampton resident. Um, I wanted to ask, you know, since I'm kind of new to the committee, um, how does a person from the public follow up on that uh, issue that Adele raised? I mean, in, for myself personally, I'm curious what the committee thinks about um, energy coach programming. And so I guess long and short of it is when will we get an answer to that? 
is, you know, is that something that you guys then decide, um, director, to put on the agenda or not, or would you? What? what yeah. I mean, first of all, it's not on the agenda, so I don't think it. I mean, there are a lot of other things on the agenda that we have to deal with today, so it could certainly be on a future agenda. Um, and I think it makes sense if the committee. I mean, you could have a conversation about whether it makes sense to go on a future agenda. We can do that, but um, we can't take it up today. Well, I understand that. I just wanted to know how to be able to follow up um, on that particular issue. And, sure. and can I follow up? Can I, you know, request that you look at something as a member of the public, you know? So I was curious about that piece. Yeah, I think it makes sense for the committee to discuss um, that and determine whether it makes sense to go on a, an agenda. So okay, maybe thanks. we can do that later in the meeting if there's time. Okay. okay. Um, anybody else? Okay. Um, before we go into the discussion of the uh, discussion and movement move on the minutes. Um, I did, um, I wanted to raise the issue, um, a couple things. One is, I think back in December, um, Adele um, graciously offered to take minutes for the committee while we didn't have a staff person, <laughs> um, aka Chris. In the meantime, um, um, Councilor Mayori also had in had um, brought someone to the forefront who had offered to take minutes. Um, so I, w she's not here, and I don't know if she was intending to do it from the screen, uh, from the video recording or not. But I just wanted to touch base again with um, Adele, since you're here, whether or not you um, would be able to take minutes today, or if you want to have this other volunteer do that. Um, this time around. I'm, I'm happy to take minutes today. Okay, that's great. Thank you. Uh, really I, appreciate that. Yeah. I can connect maybe also. Uh, well, if we need to, I can uh, connect Adele and uh, Laura, the other minute taker, if, if there's some, there might not be any crossover, but if there is. Okay, great. Thanks. Um, Okay, so next up, our um, review and approval of the minutes from January and March, and that will catch us up to where we need to be. Move to approve minutes, April and March. Second. Um, January and March. Oh, January and March. Yeah. Why did I say that? Excuse me. <laughs> I was looking at it wrong. It amended. Move to approve the minutes of January and March. I second. Great. Okay, I okay, will do roll call. Um, Pat? Yes. Uh, Tim? Yes. Uh, Rachel? Yes. Ben? Yes. Louis? Yes. And I will vote yes on that. So that's unanimous. Thanks. Okay, the next item, um, Rachel um, will describe and um, will open the floor for discussion of the specialized opt-in stretch energy code and request for endorsement of this moving forward. It would be an ordinance that um, may or may not come back to um, um, energy and sustainability, I guess, depending on what our conversation is today. So, I'll, Rachel, I can you can take it away if you'd like. She disappear. That was perfect timing. <laughs> How did that happen? <laughs> um, okay. <laughs> So um, let me see, maybe we should go to the next agenda item until she can get back on. I have no idea what happened. I'm pretty sure I did not dump her out. <laughs> um, 
Oh no, she was the next item too. Okay. <laughs> really? Um, okay. So how about if we do, um, I know Ad, um, Adele had asked this to be on the um, topic of discussion for folks and that's a draft resolution to support the House and Senate state bills for community aggregation. Um, so I don't know if, um, I did send this in the packet to you all. So I don't know if anybody had a chance to read it, you wanna discuss it. I don't know if, um, Adele, you wanted to say more about that um, before the committee discusses? Sure. Um, so there are now actually three bills in the legislature. There was a late filed bill by Representative Vitolo, um, and they're, they're all essentially the same. I have actually uh, compared uh, Chair Roy's bill with uh, Representative Vitolo's bill word for word. And it, other than moving things around, I can't tell that they're different. But in any case, they're all three very good bills. Uh, there, two of them are House bills and one is a Senate bill. And uh, what they do is they address this terrible problem that uh, DPU has been holding up community aggregations um for 12 24 months um for no good reason that anybody can figure out because the um, a lot of the applications for community um, aggregation are identical to each other so there, there doesn't appear to be a reason for uh rap for um a lack of rapid approval so these uh these three bills would impose timelines on the DPU so that they would have to approve or disapprove um, an application for a community aggregation for electricity um, within 90 days. And, and if they don't approve it, then, then it spells out how many days the, the community has to redress the application, et cetera. And um, so they're very good bills. They're very short, but they impose timelines. And so um, I can't see any reason why you all wouldn't want to endorse those uh, three bills. Um, as you know, uh, as you're well aware, Northampton, Amherst, and Pelham are trying and are very close to submitting an application to DPU for uh, community choice aggregation of electricity. And um, we certainly don't want to wait two years after we submit the application for approval. So that's the long and short of it. And I, I have started a draft of a letter if, if you are interested in, um, in supporting it. Thank you. Any comments by anyone? Rachel. Go ahead, Rachel. Yeah, I was just going to say, yeah, I, absolutely, I would support that. And uh, we can, you know, as we've done before, if we want to, we can sign on together or, you know, individually. But yes, that makes total sense to me. Thanks, Adele. I, I also think it's a good idea. In fact, I, I think it's, it's in the nature of bills that we ought to be supporting uh, statewide, nationwide to uh, basically hurry up. Um, we, we have a system that is kind of designed to slow everything down and we don't have time anymore. And this is, I mean, this is kind of, community choice aggregation is relatively small in the scheme of, of all the things that need to get done. But once, once people have agreed to do something and they've gone through all the hurdles to have things held up yet again, um, it is a, a, a big cost to those communities. Uh, it's, it, you know, they, they plan based on these things. So it's along with a lot of other things. I think once, once you've passed the hurdles, you should get your, your permission. Can you explain what it is, community choice aggregation? I'm not quite sure. If, if you're asking me, I'd be happy to uh, give you my uh, interpretation of it. 
It's uh, basically bulk buying of electricity. So a municipality oh. un under Massachusetts law, a municipality can purchase electricity for all of its um, residential and commercial customers if they desire to, because uh, it's an opt it's an opt out law. So you you can um, opt out very easily, but other otherwise you would be opted in. And the and then, communities that uh, that choose to do this can offer a variety of levels of tiers, um, <laughs> some of which have um, more than the um, RPS requires of renewable energy in the electrical supply. So those are called green community aggregations. And then some of them offer 100% um, green electricity to their customers who want to opt up to that. Okay. Can I add a little bit to, to it? Yeah. Um, because what's great about it has actually changed because the technology has moved faster than any of the communities could actually go about creating uh, uh, aggregations. So it used to be it was a community that was willing to pay possibly a little bit more to get more renewable energy was one of the ways you could do it. Essentially, it's creating your own municipal utility district, a virtual municipal utility district is essentially what it's doing. So it used to be like, oh, we'll pay a little bit more because we believe in it. Well, right now, the cheapest way to produce electricity is wind followed just, by, just a little bit by solar. But the markets set the price based on actually the highest bidder. For a, for a given block of power, which is very often the natural gas power plant. So that's great for the solar and wind companies because they're making all profit because they could have off, they made a lower bid, but the final, the settled price is actually the price set by the, uh, the, the natural gas peaker plant. These community choice aggregators, because they're not buying from national grid, Right, they're not they're not buying; they're their own aggregator. They can actually take the lower price. So now, being an aggregator actually lets you offer your community lower prices while guaranteeing more greener power. Oh, that's interesting. Hmm. And then I just add you you probably already know because it's been on the agenda a bunch of times. But just um, to um, Adele brought this up as well that you know Amherst. Um, Pelham and Northampton have been working to create an, um, a joint program. So it's not just one community doing it off on their own, but try to sort of uh, um, a sub region doing that. So there's more pooling uh, potentially of, of customers um, and providing that option for customers. But um, it takes a long time to get to the application process and then to submit it, then DPT. CPU reviews it. So that's the piece that um, has seemed to continue to get longer and longer. Um, I'm, you know, new to the conversation, but well, I think when this whole thing started, it was assumed that it might take a year. And the most recent is that we've heard that it might take two years. <laughs> so um, it's just um, a little, um, frustrating to go sort of through this whole planning process and then um, you get to the point and you think okay this is it all we need is you know them to check the boxes because you know you can only submit something where you've checked all the boxes and so you just need a checker to check your checks but it takes two years for that apparently so, so these bills expedited quicker is that what they're basically yep Thank you. In theory, I guess, but you know, they, you know, it'll it'll remain to be seen. You know, you have to have people there who are going to be doing the work. So, I don't know how they would mandate it, but. Unfortunately, our new governor has appointed two new DPU commissioners, so presumably they'll, they'll be motivated to uh, expedite things. Um, so does it make sense that, uh, I mean, Adele, you said you had a draft resolution. Do you want to bring it to the, do you, um, when do you think it's necessary to have this um, move forward? I don't know where it is in the, in the status. Do you want it 
do you want to finalize a resolution and bring a final for the committee to vote on as a letter of support or um, do you need something sooner? Uh, well, you could vote today to support the three bills and then we can work out the wording later. Um, it's up to you. Uh, either one is okay. fine. I, I don't think there's any uh, rush on this. Um, maybe it makes sense to get the draft language in front of everybody and then then we can vote on that. So if we can set it to come back um, on the June agenda, does that make sense for everybody? Okay, that'd be great. Thank you. Um, all right, Rachel, you're back and you're up. <laughs> that was some brilliant timing. <laughs> and I'm not sure why that it might not, it, it may happen again and then I'll switch to my phone. I'm having some computer issues, but anyway, okay. yes, that was brilliant. Um, Right, so I'm circling back to the specialized energy code. We've talked a lot about it over the last six months, and I believe we brought it to um, to this commission for a, a endorsement, and we didn't have um, a, a quorum that day. So I'm really hoping to bring this to, to either. Uh, my plan is to sponsor um, to sponsor it as an opt-in for Northampton, either as a general ordinance through city council. Uh, the other route is to get the mayor to sign on and to issue an order. So I'm still working that out, but I thought it would be good if we, uh, you know, if we talked about it again and got an official endorsement if possible. Um, I know, you know, Louise, your note, I reviewed your notes, they're great. Uh, Adele has a lot to say about them. I'll just br briefly review because I know we've talked about a lot, but there might, might be um, new folks too. So the specialized code, energy code, builds on uh, the stretch, the, the existing stretch code and base code. And then those are also being updated. The, the, stretch, the stretch code um, is, is going to see some changes, some updates by, I believe, June or July. So, so the opt-in specialized energy code is really just giving municipalities, a, you know, an option um, and that's that you know that i i feel will help us more quickly get to and in fact i think it's actually critical in terms of meeting our um our goals in northampton and the state feels it's critical in meeting the state's goals of carbon neutrality um so that's why it's here uh, and so you know just a brief history so that the, the energy the specialized energy code is now under mass doer um, it is under Mass DOER as and and not, you know, the building uh, the Board of Building Regulations and Standards where the other codes are. So it's a little some complication. The other two codes you don't you don't have to opt in. This is an opt in one, and so it takes a vote on our on the municipalities um, part. Um, let's see what else can I say about it. Uh, we can look at it. You know, so it has two parts. It basically it has these append appendices. CMR 22 and CMR 23, that one that addresses residential and one that addresses commercial uh, built new, you know, building. And the idea is, of course, you know, existing structures, um, you know, uh, existing structures, of course, contribute to our, you know, to, to our carbon emissions. But this, but new construction is really a place, a critical place where we can kind of um, move the dial. Um, and actually, it's quite cost efficient to do this now to um, to to promote like to promote electrification and um, and, and new construction. And you you know they, they they have a mixed fuel option. So, but the, but the idea is that if there's some fossil fuel present, you also have to have these other you know stipulations, solar um, electrification ready. So that's the idea. And there's some exemptions, and I think you know that you can make and you can um, you know there's some solar um, stipulations, but exemptions such as you know shaded site or whatever. And there's some there's a little bit of latitude that municipalities have within their own specialized code to to address you know that but there are but there's a guides you have to follow and the, the other you know there's so many good reasons to, to i feel to opt in um to be part of the green communities program uh, i think this is where we're going anyway is i think it's the most cost efficient way to, to get to our uh, to our 
carbon goals. And um, yeah, so we can pull them up. You know, I just didn't know who would be here and how much, because we've talked a lot about it, but also, you know, so why don't I pause and just we can open up for discussion and uh, see where everyone's at in terms of what we might want to go over about the specialized code or, or not, <laughs> or not go over. <laughs> I have a question maybe for Louie or um, anybody else that does building. <laughs> yeah. um, is the timeline, are, are we still on track with the timeline, the anticipated sort of roll in of the updated stretch code? So um, that was supposed to happen in January, early 2023. Has that been, are we there with that um, new, those new standards? Yeah, I mean, unless Ben wants to go forward, it's um, it's a complicated situation, but we are. Um, okay. the, in March, the um, I'm not sure who, but um, the pushing and shoving um, got sort of resolved in March. Sorry, let me back up a minute. Um, the Board of Building Regulations and Standards and Department of Energy, uh, DOER, Department of Energy Conservation and Resources, um struggled about the stretch energy code and the board of building regulations and standards wanted it in the building code and doer wasn't willing to wait and so but what it's boiled down to is that um, doer came out with a, as close to a final version of this code as they could in december of 2022 the Board of Building Regulations and Standards looked at it. There was a lot of discussion and in and couldn't come up with their the BBRS version of the energy, how to adopt the DOER energy code. So um, I think they went to um, the governor. I'm pretty sure it had to have been the governor, somebody above them. And they came out with a statement that says, um, DOER is the people who wrote the code, and this is the code, and PBRS is instructing building officials to enforce this code, um, even though it's not in the building code yet. Um, right now, they haven't quite finished the 10th edition of the building code, which is, they haven't quite finished the 10th edition of the building code since 2021, literally. So it's, but, but regardless, the new energy code is in, is in full force and effect and the re residential code starts started january 1st and the commercial code and the opt-in code starts uh july 1st if the city opts into it otherwise it's back to the basic inner doer energy code without the opt-in aspect of it so we've got it we're here now with it. Um, somehow the BBRS will write the uh, building code so that it clearly requires that buildings meet the new stretch energy code. But the energy code itself, I think, is going to live on its own with DOER. Right. I, I just okay. wanted to add that, um, and there's a six month the 12 month you know window in which they advise that you roll it out. It's not effective immediately, but you. Well, I, I think you got to look at the opt in piece because I'm not sure that if you, I, I mean, what I'm hearing, and this is, it's a really confusing situation. Um, but what I'm hearing is that the, if you opt in, then it's in full force and effect um, <laughs> right away. There may be a six month concurrency for the opt in portion of the code from July 1st to December. 31st, but I heard some arguments about that. I, I don't, people are confused. I mean, even people who are ought to know really what's happened and the people who I thought were making the decisions um, seem to be confused. But, but for sure, looking at what we've got, the opt-in code matches the planning board requirements that we've adopted for um, Permits requ uh, developments requiring special permits. So I don't think we're very far. We're not going to have. Um, it's not going to have a tremendous effect on um, the the energy code requirements for Northampton, and it's certainly a step in the right direction. Um, 
that's that's all it doesn't mean that I necessarily agree with the way the code's written, but it's the code and we're going to get it. We've got it and we're going to work forward with it. Thanks. Hey, everybody confused enough or should I go or should I go on further? <laughs> <laughs> um, anybody on the commission uh, before we take a deal? Have comments? Yeah, I just, well, I just wanted to add that this, you know, the home rule petition that we passed on new construction is much more stringent than this. And so, you know, I think we've kind of made a, a point of where we want to go. And um, I don't think it's redundant because we don't know what's going to happen with the home rule petition. And I think, I, you know, I, it's also, a, it's, it's really um, a political statement to say this is what we want. Um, as a municipality, we want to join um, with other municipalities and raising our voice here on this. And I think it fits neatly in with our climate regeneration goals. But I, I do see, and I see the confusion. I think the changing of the hands, Louis, perhaps, is where from Matt, from BBRS to, to Mass DOER, where we, uh, the confusion ensues. Um, but in any case, beyond the confusion, I, I do think that, um, it's to me, it's rather moderate. I mean, it allows for, you know, mixed, you know, I mean, the hers ratings are a little more stringent, but you know, it's not like, a, I don't think it's a radical, you know, as you said. So I'll just add that and I'll let Adele, you know, go. Um, let me take Ben first. Uh, so, I mean, I I sign on with, with Louis at kind of every, all, the, all of his comments, including the confusing nature of the rollout and handoffs and all of that stuff. Um, I guess so. Most of the builders that I work at work with have been exceeding code by a lot for a very long time, right? That this isn't all builders. This is just kind of the ones that I that that, that uh, and we have quite a few of them in in our region that are just kind of the types who the idea that they would only build to code is just not in their DNA, and that's actually been really protective for them as the code kind of caught up with them, they didn't have to change their system. They'd been developing a system, you know, and using new materials as they came along, using new new products. But, um, you know, by holding themselves to a higher standard from the beginning, when duct tightness uh, became part of the, the code, well, they'd already been, you know, sealing their ducts. And they'd already been sizing their ducts for, for low, lower static pressure you know, all I'm, I don't mean to get into the details, but these are all things that make you heat pump ready, for example. You, you know, like so, in a sense, we're doing a favor to even the ones who don't want to do to exceed code. We're doing a favor to our local builders by helping them kind of get ahead of the game because it's going to catch up to them eventually. And once you've got your system, you don't have to redesign anything, you don't have you know you can you're good at pricing your stuff so i i feel like whatever we can do to kind of just like hit hit a target early will actually be a benefit in the long run when the hers when the hers ratings uh in what was it 2009 when we first started looking at hers ratings a lot and right on through about 2000 and um 17 or 18 when the DOER took over managing the reports of the of the building permit reports for um for hers ratings the city consistently posted an average hers rating of you know five four five six seven points below the code requirement so an awful lot of the Northampton contractors as Ben said or a lot of the contractors who are working in Northampton, I'm not sure where they're all from, um, built ahead of code. Um, even some of the contractors who complained bitterly about it built ahead of code. It became a little bit of what things look like in Northampton. Um, I wasn't able to get an awful lot of um, comparison numbers, but. Northampton is of, of the numbers that were available, Northampton was right up um, at the top of the Commonwealth's um, averages, or right at the bottom of the Commonwealth averages, however you want to look at it. 
So I don't think we're going to have a lot of trouble with this. Um, I mean, I think it's going to be a painful process, but I don't think that the pain is going to come from anything that we do here. I think the pain is already in place. And one thing about um, having a system in order to um, build ahead of code, the system's going to have to change. And one of the one of my issues with the uh, energy code is that it's written differently than the than building codes have been written for quite a long time. Mm -hmm. And so the people, the contractors who are really, you know, who've been dealing with building code for quite a long time, we're going to have to learn to to approach things in a kind of a different fashion. But but the quality of the, I mean, the the level of energy conservation should stay consistent. And and in I believe it'll end up being certainly as low as or potentially lower than most communities in North Hampton, I mean, in the state anyway. Well, um, very interesting. Um, it may very well be confusing for all of those reasons, um, but when you really boil it down, the new opt-in stretch energy code is really almost the same as the stretch energy code, the new stretch energy code. Um, and the only differences are two differences. One is that it would, re if builders decide to use the fossil fuel pathway um, allowed in this new opt-in code, uh, they would have to pre-wire for electrification. So that would protect the consumer who buys the house uh, from really expensive upgrades later. So it's, a, it's really a com consumer protection um, issue that we could think of it that way anyway. And the other one, the other difference is um, that um, if for those buildings that are that have chosen the fossil fuel pathway, they would be required to add solar to the roof. So, um, so the, the, the re, they're really not that different. And uh, as a green community, we would of course follow the new stretch code. So um, this opt-in stretch code is really um, not a whole lot different and would be required for certain buckets of state funding um, you you would your municipality would be required to have adopted the opt-in stretch code, and 15 communities already have, including Boston. Mm -hmm. So, and just one last thing is that based on the Northampton's um, current um, zoning regulations, it's there aren't going to be an awful lot of houses built in Northampton that that don't have new houses built in Northampton that don't have some relationship to a special permit, which is going to push Northampton's zoning regulations into play. And, and that's going to get, um, that's going to create barriers to fossil fuels in and of itself. So. I think it's, I think it's a no, I think this is a no brainer. I think that after a year and a half, of struggle, um, the way the dust is beginning to settle, and this is the this is the way things are going, and we're not going to uh, put an undue burden on schools in Northampton if if we pass this, if we if we put it in front of city council and they pass it. I guess is a better way. So should we? Um, should someone want to make a motion to recommend that this move? forward that Councillor Maori um, put it on the council agenda and then that doesn't then it doesn't have to be referred back to this committee before it makes its way to through ordinance the typical ordinance review. Sure. Uh, I guess I I move that the uh, opt-in uh, act portion of the stretch code is endorsed by NESC and recommended to the city council for adoption. And I'd second that. Um, any discussion on the matter before we do a roll call vote? Okay, um, I'll start with Tim. 
Uh, yes. Uh, ben. Yes. Pat. Yes. Louie. Yes. Rachel. Yes. And I will vote yes as well. So that's unanimous. Great. Thank you. And the next item, Rachel, you're still up. So, and you still have Wi Fi or some kind of internet. Um, so, do you want to go move on to the uh, mowing discussion? Oh, my. Yeah. Well, uh, yeah. So, thanks, thanks everyone for that last bit. And yeah, I was just going to put out um, we really to continue with the, uh, the mowing subcommittee. We really need uh, some other subcommittee members. Um, so if we can all put the word out there um, to see if anyone would like to join our subcommittee or even just kind of support us, <laughs> that would be great. You know what? There are two people missing. One person is probably already on this um, subcommittee, right? Rich? Rich, yes. So it's Rich and so I. So you know when people are missing, they get assigned to subcommittees. Did you ah, know that rule? I like that <laughs> rule. Excellent. So, yeah. Um, no, I'm just kidding. Um, I, oh, a point of order, uh, actually, Carolyn. I was thinking, can how does it work? Can can we get support from residents who aren't commissioners on a subcommittee? I guess we can kind of informally get support. There just seems to be, of course, many people engaged on, you know. Uh, pollinators and you know and uh mowing reduction so i was just wondering how that worked if we could you know uh we had some comments before if i could reach out to those folks and they can support a subcommittee or you know and they're not but they're not commissioners right so you'd want to have i mean um i don't think he, there's a mandatory number to create a subcommittee um so you could have two and then have support from other people who you know, would be part of your convening. But um, if you wanted another member, I mean, we're also down to member, well, three members total. One will be coming on board, but we need to get two more members. So you could yeah. also, if no one in this, on these boxes want to participate, we, you can also wait until um, we're fully back um, yeah. as a um, commission. I'll get, I might bring it up again then when we get new commissioners. Okay, new blood. <laughs> um, okay, so um, we'll not take any action on that. The next item, since we already talked about the community aggregation, Ben, do you want to talk about um, street design manual from Oslo? Sure. So. Um... <laughs> Uh, the one thing I thought Angie was going to be joining us, and I know this is an area that she's concerned about. Um, so, so, so I want to preface this by saying this is a not very fully baked uh, idea or you know or, or concept. But in discussing NESC with a variety of people, so, some of whom were thinking about submitting their, their names to join NESC. So what, what does NESC do and what's, what's on your agenda? And we spend a lot of time on buildings and that makes sense. Um, and we have some expertise about buildings, um, but we also have people coming in and should have, I think more people with expertise on the, uh, a big environmental impact, which is transportation systems. Um, and, so this, so my my main reason for bringing this up is is to say, it, obviously we have a transportation and and parking com, uh, committee and you know there we have other entities, but from a sustainability point of view, we should be thinking about this from the sustainability point of view, and then try to think about how can we, what can we do systematically, um, so uh, you know. I guess uh, if it's all right, can I share my screen again? Like I said, very half baked, but I have some images that help to discuss stuff. Yeah, um, hold on. Okay. All right, you should be good. Okay. Uh, all 
Okay, some, something like that. Um, and making it pretty. So, it, but like I said, I, I, uh, it, I for, didn't have much time to, to put this together. And I, I know that we are bound by federal uh, road design rules and, and manuals, and there are state manuals. And, and I know that uh, a lot of this discussion could get eliminated right away by saying, well, as a city, we can do very, very little. But I'd like to start by saying, well, what, what, what should we be doing? What should we be wanting to do? How do, how do we ex express who we see ourselves as, as a city? And maybe start from starting from there, think about how do we enable ourselves to do the things that we otherwise would say, oh, we're, we just can't do them. They're, you know, they're, they're not within our power. Um, so the first thing is to to set the stage is an observation, which is I do not think that we can get to decarbonization of um, uh, of our transportation system through electrification. It's important, but we can't do it all that way. And particularly if we mostly focus on electric passenger vehicles. In other words, we take the exact same transportation system we have, which is mostly cars, and we just change the drivetrain. And one of the ways of looking at it is just how much lithium is required. So not only, you know, we're talking about lightweight EVs like a Chevy Bolt or something, um, that's a, about, uh, you know, 1.6 1, 1. kilograms per rider. Um, and that, so, so eight kilograms of a battery. So it's just the, that amount of lithium that has to get mined from somewhere and acquired from somewhere. But increasingly, like Chevy Bolt's being discontinued, increasingly the manufacturers are giving people what they want and what they want in America is SUVs. And the reason we want SUVs is because of an arms race. Because if, if, if I get hit by your SUV and I'm in a smaller car, I'm more likely to die. In fact, that's one of the reasons they can sell an SUV. So even though I didn't really want an SUV, I may have to just buy an SUV so that I'm more competitive. And so we have this arms race in America that we don't have in other countries. But that is one reason why you're going to have to carry even more lithium in these, in these batteries. Whereas if we put the lithium into buses, yes, it's a lot of lithium per bus, but per rider, it's, uh, it, it's about a quarter. And even more efficient is if we just used an e-bike, that's a teeny tiny amount of, of lithium in that battery, but the, you know, it's one rider per, per battery and, and we get go a lot. So if we were to change, not uh, what we you transport ourselves in, but what our mode is, we could actually use a lot less energy. We could make the transition a lot faster. And um, it, we can talk about how I also think our lives would be better, but, but, um, but so this was this was from a, a study um, actually out of, out of um, Davis, California. And again, this is national level, and 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 I do want to bring this down to our own city. But just as a sense of context, if we were to have less car dependency, even with medium-sized batteries, we could use a whole lot less less lithium, which means we could actually do it faster. Right, we don't have to acquire nearly as much lithium. We don't have to have as many big battery factories. We can do a whole lot if we could just become less dependent on cars. So, how do we become less dependent on cars? Um, you know, it, 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 the answer is often well, we could walk and bike and use transit, but people don't, right? And so, uh, and a large reason for why they don't is because it's either inconvenient it's perceived to be dangerous or it's actually dangerous. And it's some of all of those things. So most people uh, are uncomfortable riding on, on the road. I'm, so I'm somebody who's basically bike commuted my entire life in any type of weather, I'm very comfortable with it, but most people don't. And the truth is, and, and I will say that in recent years, I have experienced more close calls more uh more cars kind of driving aggressively close to me and um you know so there are reasons why why even experienced bike commuters like me uh 
can hesitate. Um, and what we want, and I think leads to a better life for everyone, like just more pleasurable and enjoyment of, of life, is actually to at least feel that you have the option that any day when it's, you know, pleasant enough, you could decide, do I want to ride the car? Do I want to ride a bike? And which one is the best choice for me today? And right now, in most of the places in the city where people live, it's not necessarily an open choice, right? So if you have to run an errand, mo and, oh, and most trips are one mile or less, and most trips are done in a car. So we could dramatically cut our carbon emissions from transportation if we could just get more people biking and walking, right? And with the new uh, electric bikes, that becomes even more convenient for, for people, and we are seeing a lot more of them. But this danger thing is a real thing. And in fact, the U.S. is actually getting worse. Uh, we, we had a decline in deaths per, per million miles traveled. This is just general uh, uh, road safety. Everybody else has continued to decline, but we've actually started to go up. Some of that has to do with your likelihood of surviving getting hit by a car is less because more than half of them are SUVs, whereas in, the, in other countries, less than half of them are, are SUVs. So it's just simply mass times velocity equals force, right? So, so you're less likely to survive. So we actually have reasons why we need to improve safety if we want people to be using these other modes. And so the one place I would say we shouldn't look, look to for advice is us, because we clearly do not know how to make it work. <laughs> And some of these other places do. And so Nor Norway is an example of a place that was always fairly safe and has gotten even safer. And they recently developed a street design manual. And what I really liked about this is, um, well, it's, uh, let me put it this way, it struck me, um, uh, pardon the metaphor, uh, when uh, um, we had a fatality of, 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 of a cyclist in front of the high school. And it took us a year to get some advice from a, 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 a transportation uh, um, engineering firm that we paid good money to. Um, it took us a year to get what was kind of really lackluster advice. Not that we've done anything, but we got some advice and we paid money. And in the meantime, we had a number of close calls and, and, uh, and injuries of, of high school students. We have this high danger place and we're so slow to be able to act. And I think partly that's because our system says we have to pay these engineers to go and tell us what to do and they have to reinvent the wheel. And we may or may not communicate clearly to them what are the rules in our community that are required beyond, well, you have to do a roundabout or at least explore it. And um, you know that was about it. And uh, and that wouldn't wouldn't have even been the best solution. And so I think if we had a guide, if we had something that we as a city had had said, this is really who we are and what we value, that we could accelerate all these changes. And every time we intervened in a street, we'd know what to do, or at least we'd be closer to knowing what to do. Um, and I just thought I'd compare and contrast. Uh, so this is. Uh, on, on the right is from the Oslo Street Design Guide, and on the uh, um, uh, uh, on the left is a goal from our um, uh, sustainability uh, 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 what's it called resiliency plan, and it's it's kind of revealing. Um, so they say, well, the first thing is walking, cycling, and transport should be the preferred choices. Our first objective, maintain an efficient transportation system, which, what, what's efficiency? What, that, that's, it's very unclear. It actually doesn't give us any guidance. They say uh, they've got a goal. All cars on Oslo's roads should be emissions free by 2030, which is pretty aggressive, but they're actually heading towards it. We say, well, reduce the use of single occupancy vehicles, but we don't really have a metric as associated with it. Um, we say ensure environmental impacts are considered and adverse effects are minimized, um, which you know kind of makes me wonder, well, just let's say how many deaths of pedestrians is the right number of deaths of pedestrians to accommodate 
say a certain traffic speed. It, you know, we, we don't actually have that number in there, but it's implied that there is such a number. Um, and, you know, it says use intelligent transportation systems. I don't know what that is. And then the last priority, the very last one is ensure the needs of transit services, bicycle, pedestrian, and wheelchairs are considered and addressed. Great. Oslo is saying do them first, right? It made it, so they've made a statement of their own community's values, and we've kind of made a statement of our community's values, but it's a little bit more wishy-washy. I think we could probably do a little better. And then if you look at what we have in our transportation and land use requirements, we first we say, yeah, move to EVs. Let's focus on EVs. And, and like the nation as a whole, that's been our answer to transportation. It's just EVs. For bicycling options, we say we should promote it as safe, efficient, you know, say good things about it, right? Um, and what, what I particularly like is um, uh, advanced bicycle education. Because what that says is that it is the responsibility of the cyclist to not die. That's, that's what that's about. It's we're not going to actually do anything in the infrastructure to make it so that you're less likely to die, but you should learn how to be aware so that you can kind of jump out of the way. Um, here's how Oslo has expressed their values and, you know, and laid it out. They've, they've said pedestrians on top. We think about them first. Then we think about cyclists, public transit, commercial vehicles, and cars last. That's what we're going to think about. And in every area where we're redesigning some streets or we're, we're doing anything, we think about what is the pathway that each user, car, pedestrian, cycles, floods, public transport, all these components, quite frankly, all the components that I know that Carolyn's shop thinks about all the time, they're saying that when you do a street, any intervention with a street, you should be thinking about all these things and they don't have to be the same. So we can see here there's, you know, cyclists paths and cars paths uh, overlap some and don't overlap some. Pedestrians and cyclists overlap some and also don't overlap some. So it's not that everybody has to go everywhere, but you have to think about how everyone's going to get everywhere. And they kind of put that in. I like that they also have definitions, difference between a street and a road. Um, right, what, what we have, King Street is an example of something that's trying to be a street and also a road at the same time, right? And we've tried to improve it, right? We've put some serious money into trying to improve it, but it's very hard because we're not sure which thing it is. And then the other thing is in this manual, they have must and shoulds. And so there are certain things that absolutely have to happen, can't be waived, and then there's shoulds. And so, you know, for example, I, we have a should, which is the, uh, the the roundabout. You should consider a roundabout. You need a waiver to figure out that, that it's not going to work in this particular example. Um, and then they classify streets. And these classifications of streets help you think about whether it's a street or a road. And if we're going to, if it's going to be a, a road, then it's going to fall under, uh, you know, it's got higher complexity of traffic, and maybe we're going to keep cars there, and we're going to deprioritize others. And then there are other places we're going to, going to deprioritize cars, and these are just some examples of like very heavy pedestrian seat streets, a cyclist-oriented street, and a transit-oriented street. All of these are in the A category. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, then we have some streets that might look familiar to us, right? This this one down here kind of feels a bit like a, a street that we have in town. Um, and so that helps you figure out well, what set of rules should apply, which means that let's say we have a problem that we want to solve and we go to an engineering firm, we're not going to get a set of a set of solutions that don't set our fit our rules that we've already predetermined. This is a particular the thing that's of interest to me. So um, I, one way to keep people safe is to slow traffic down. And in fact, we can have cyclists and pedestrians and cars in the same space as long as they are, the cars are moving slow enough that they can avoid hitting the pedestrians and the cyclists. Um, 
And the way we set, uh, the, the way we decide whether we want to do a traffic calming project here is we first, we've got a road and we figure out the speed limit on that road, either by statute or we go and measure how fast the cars are going. And we say, well, whatever the 85th percentile is, that should be the speed limit, which is to say, in the mind of a driver, what is the speed that they feel comfortable before they're worried that they might damage their car, right? That's how we're setting the speed limit. The Oslo Street Design Guide says, at every location, how far can you see? And that is your stopping distance. And we're going to regulate the speed based on your stopping distance. Then we've regulated the speed based on something physical in the road, right? That's based on how well can you stop a car so that you don't kill a pedestrian. <laughs> and that determines the speed. And then we decide whether we need uh, 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 the speed uh, reduction measures based on actually measuring if 15% of the people exceed the speed limit that we've set by your stopping distance, then we'd better slow you down. And they then have a set of, of speed reduction measures that they've already predetermined are kind of the order of, of, of preference with speed humps uh, being uh, not the, the, uh, the, the preferred method and using other methods, including road narrowing and, and what they what they call blue-green function, we might call it uh, a green infrastructure. Um, so they, they uh, um, dis determine pedestrian crossings based on measured pedestrian sizes and expected pedestrian sizes. The basic principle is if we want to see cyclists, if we want to see pedestrians, let's design for the ones that we want to come. And once they know it's safe, they'll come. Whereas here, we very often say, I haven't seen any cyclists riding in the street. So I guess, uh, you know, we haven't counted that many of them. Therefore, it's not, it's not a heavy demand for it. So we can't really justify investing in cycle infrastructure. Well, of course, they're not there. They don't want to die. <laughs> um, Oh, yeah, I used that slider. Right. And what I so here I, I particularly like this one where it, they give you a decision tree that helps you say, okay, what's what's our traffic? Is it a two-way street or a one-way street? If it, let's say if it's two-way street, we can follow this decision tree down to what is the appropriate cycle uh, lane or cycle um, uh, facility based on all these these factors, which means that we can. Because we build it into the guide, we can predetermine a lot of this, and we don't have have to slowly wait for an engineering firm to provide us a design, and then maybe five years later we start working on the project that they started designing so long ago. We can kind of get more of what we want faster. Um, and uh, you know, so that bunch of musts I, uh, and cycle parking. Anyway, like I said. A, a fairly poorly baked presentation, I'll, I'll grant you. <laughs> um, but uh, but I, I want to start a conversation, see if it's an area that we want to go into, or even if anybody or or some percentage of people uh, agree with this kind of approach. Um, and so there, that's the ideas. <laughs> Thanks, Ben. Um, I, I mean, for poorly baked, um, there were some good slides in there, for sure. <laughs> so, um, it's interesting because I don't think we're talking enough about the connection between where people are and where they want to go in a way that's non-vehicular. And also it, it relates to where we, sh you know, where we're al allowing more people to be so that they can connect to where they want to go in a way that's not always with cars. So um, I and but I and I do agree that this commission is a good place to have that conversation besides just energy and buildings and um, electrification. Um, and so I wonder and I, I you know, I think um, I like the fact that you um, sort of 
poked holes in our plan and sort of show that in some ways we may be upside down in our thinking <laughs> um, about our goals. Um, and it also, I think, is reflective of sort of the culture in this country um, and in Western Mass and heaven forbid in Northampton yeah. um, <laughs> that we, um, many of us still um, are focusing or, or the, the mentality, I think it's really just being stuck in a rut that's been given to us and we've just become used to thinking in this way from the 1950s when the interstate highway came through. You know, this is just the way we do it and we, we've been tweaking around the edges, I guess. Um, it is interesting to sort of think about the overlap with TPC and what we, um, what we might be able to work in tandem um, with them on. Um, but it probably does make sense to think, I mean, I would suggest that maybe we could talk about some of those policy shifts or mindset shifts in, in thinking. I don't know um, about the, you know, I guess it's part of that mindset and that sort of rut about, you know, you always, need to spend six months to a year to 18 months on an engineer before you can do the process i mean that's sort of how our i think our whole engineering programs are set up around that um, kind of structure um so that piece might be hard to change but it may be that there are pieces that don't need that level of intent you know it's kind of like the um you know, tactical urbanism uh, mentality where there are things we know can be done quickly and they're, tr they're sort of trials in that sense, but in fact, they're not gonna ruin a street if we do them. And so maybe there are those things that then can be more codified into a design manual. Um, so I don't know where that goes, but I just, I, um, and obviously other people wanna say something that completely counters that and <laughs> that's fine. Um, but I would certainly think that it makes sense to explore this a little bit more and maybe start to pick off pieces that make sense in terms, certainly in terms of policy is sort of thinking about that shift and making it more comfortable for people to shift out of their use of cars for every single trip that they take. So. Go ahead, Rachel. Yeah, no, I I found that fascinating and not half baked. It. No, it was making me hungry. I must be hungry. I was trying to think of those dishes that are half baked. Those French. I couldn't think of the word. Anyway, back on topic. I found it fascinating, and you know, I was thinking, um, yeah, a, a little bit what you were saying, Carolyn, about we have these structures, and you know, municipal, you know, ways are rather risk averse. And the missing piece might be what you were saying about like that whole, you know, if we build it, they will come kind of idea. And that feels like a leap of faith to to municipal, you know, uh, folks. But the, and so maybe the way to go about it is more the proactive thing of um, building on small successes. So. You know, I would certainly, I, I, you know, it certainly makes sense. It is frustrating that taking, you know, it, that takes too long to address something really dire, like around the high school. And I'm, so I'm not saying we shouldn't try to speed that up, but I'm also thinking if we could get people comfortable with the idea of what you just said, that, you know, in, in smaller ways, then maybe we'd be ready to make bigger changes when we needed to. So, you know, just like, you know, that side street, I thought, I remember when we were, I will bring up Warfield Place, but you know when we were talking about the use of a street like that, and some of the residents wanted a real mixed use. And I, there is a, and Alex Jarrett would know the name of it, some German word, of course, Dutch word for it. But anyway, other I, you know, it's just kind of we're re completely redoing this street from you know from um, radically. And can we think outside the box in terms of what that might look like on this tiny little street, right? But uh, that's close to downtown, and that would have been a nice opportunity to say. So, if it's a failure, you know, it's like we haven't done the entire city or whatever. So, I guess my my first reaction is very exciting, and I think that you know, if, if we could just kind of prove to people that what you're saying is true, that if you know places where you don't see bikes, if you you know make it inviting, they will show up. 
it's a small point, but I actually think it's a sticking point for risk adverse, you know, uh, budget tight communities. And I think, but I think we could prove it pretty easily with smaller projects like that and then build on them. Um, yeah, that would be interesting. But we'd, so we'd, we'd take risks, but we'd take smaller risks um, and hopefully show what happens when you take a, just even a small section and, and you know, um, so anyway, and this is a bigger conversation, but I was curious about, you know, how you saw, saw the down, the, the redesign um, in terms of the Oslo um, kind of lens. Anyway, I mean, thank you very much. I can answer that, that one. Obviously, I've been involved and in think about and care about the, the whole the Main Street uh, redesign. And um, actually, I did. I had that in mind as I was looking at their uh, plan. And we did quite well, actually, by their plan, basically, that our Main Street redesign follows the rules that they let laid down. They're not, they're not that extreme. Um, it, it, with with one exception, they absolutely forbid on any streets anything other than uh, parallel parking. Um, that th that one's a must, not a, not a should. It's just not allowed. Um, well, but sorry. No, no, no. Was just, I was going to say to build on that, I think, and just sort of Rachel's point, you know. The King Street um, project that just is almost completed um, is similar in that, you know, some people say, well, we already have a bike path that's parallel for a portion of King Street. Why do we need to put something in the street? And it's sort of that whole complete streets requirement from VASDOT now that is we need to think about all of those, even if you think nobody's going to be biking there. So we're we've taken these little puzzle pieces and started that. I also, you know, we've for years the planning board has required sidewalks to be built on pro you know in front of properties and it may not connect to any other sidewalk but the planning mm -hmm. board always required it and everybody gave the planning board grief to put it lightly that why would you require a sidewalk there nobody's walking there and it's like well because yeah. the next property is going to come along and we're going to get it done and then and people are walking there or we should allow them to if they want to. And so, but that's always been a struggle. If there were a policy or there, you know, objectives that were identified in a plan saying, this is we, this is the way we want to do it. We want to turn it around and think about it this way first, then there wouldn't be as much, I mean, people will still give grief no matter what. But at least you can point to that and say, see, we decided as a community that this is a priority for us to make it, you know, even if we can't do everything at once, we start to think about them every time we have the opportunity to make these changes. Then, you know, bit by bit and maybe big chunk by big chunk, we start moving in that direction and more people will feel comfortable using the network instead of just the car users feeling comfortable using the network. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I 100% agree with that. And, you know, and so it's really just the more that we can pre think about these things and, you know, kind of make it easier. Because I think one of the neat things about this plan is that you realize that there are a lot of streets where all users can coexist on the same level and you know where you, we don't need necessarily separated bike lanes and separate you know we don't need a main street redesign level of of infrastructure on every single street and so by categorizing streets and and really being smart about speed limits and then recognizing as they do in their guide that speed limit signs are useless um, but that street structure is effective. But, you know, by doing those sorts of things uh, and lots of signaling, lots of, you know, material or color signaling that helps people understand where they are. And it is about culture change, right? Because we, we learn how to read the street the same way we you know, learn how to read our language. Um, and, it, you know, but by starting by codifying the language of street uh, structure, we, we get more polite. And we're already good, like, I mean, or good by our own standards. 
um, uh, my wife, who's from the South, was like, she was shocked when, uh, you know, when I used to stop at when pedestrians were in a, in a crosswalk. <laughs> like, you no know, people, you know, she was like, people don't do that in the South. <laughs> But we do that here, and, and I grew up with that. And, you know, so it's in some ways, it's about kind of like just building on that culture. Um, so, oh, is, I was just going to quickly say that, you know, maybe, you know, if we, especially if we can get some more commissioners, it would be great to actually look, go back to the plan and try to make it something that could be a guideline for the TPC or because I think that's part of it is having something to go to, you know. Mm -hmm. Um, and making that second nature so it becomes a culture. And so that would be good to revise that with more, you know, parameters or something. That'd be a great project for someone who is really, you know, uh, about that. But anyway, yes. Well, so, so I was going to follow up and just say, if I don't know if the any other comments from other um, commission members, um, but maybe to that point of trying to get um, maybe put it on a future agenda for sort of thinking how um, something like that might get started. Maybe we should wait for a couple more members. Um, I mean, I, I wouldn't want to put it off just for that, but I'm just sort of, um, you know, maybe there, maybe um, we could think of sort of an outline of things that might make sense for further discussion and how this commission could be involved on the um, upcoming agenda. Great. Thanks again, Ben, appreciate it. Um, I guess the last items are counselor updates and department head reports. I didn't get any specific information from anybody, so I'm not sure if anybody has things that they want to mention um, before we wrap up. Everyone's raising their hand at once. This is just too, it's too chaotic. I'm sorry. Oh, great, Louie, go for it. I think a simple, you know, um, you know, 25 words or less summary of where the stretch energy code is at might not be a bad thing. Um, right now there's a draft copy and I say draft copy because there seems there's some discussion between the Board of Building Regulations and Standards and the Department of Energy Resources about what the stretch energy, what the energy codes are going to look like. It's 225 CMR um, chapters 22 and 23 residential and then commercial and very clearly the um, Board of Building Regulations and Standards and the Department of Energy Resources have together put out a statement that the 225 CMR 22 and 23 are the energy codes for, for Massachusetts. And as near as I can tell, the most recent versions are from December of 2022. So these are the two codes. And um, even though the building code references um, its own energy code currently, the ninth edition, which is the current edition of the building code references, the building codes um, energy code provisions, um, they're not. Now they're DOER's energy code. And when the, when the state building code updates to the 10th edition, which um, ought to happen soon, but people have been saying that for a year and a half, it'll, it'll be a done deal. There'll be one single code, it'll be, just like the building code enforces the regulations for the architectural access board uh, regulations then um, the building code enforces the regulations for the stretch code um, and once we once the um, opt-in code is in place i think we'll see um, some more changes and uh, my take on it is that it's going to be, there's going to be an awful lot more engineers involved in the process that they've written they've rewritten the code they've changed the wording it's confusing for contractors it's going to go towards for residential one and two family it's going to go towards hers raters or passive house raters and it's going to go to full-on energy 
um, conservation engineers for commercial. Thanks. Anybody else? All right. I think that's the end of the agenda then. Um, so anybody want to move to adjourn? Move to adjourn? I guess we don't want to, but I'll, I'll do it anyway. Yeah. Move to okay. adjourn. Second. second. <laughs> All right, Louis, second. All right. Um, don't think we necessarily need to do a roll call, but what the heck. Um, Louis? Yes. Uh, Tim? Yes. Ben? Yes. Rachel? And Pat? Yes. And I would also concur. So great. Thank you all.